Cool. All right. Um, it's exactly noon Eastern time. Um, thank you guys so much for being here today. Um, I'm really excited to learn from Dilesia this morning about how the current crisis can be affecting or may be affecting um, spiritual abuse survivors. Um, I think her talk, when she you know, submitted her idea, I felt like it was so pertinent to what was going on right now. Um, and I'm really excited to hear you present today. Um, thank you for being on this morning. You're welcome. I, you know, when I got the invitation, I was like, what can I talk about? Because I saw the other topics and I was yeah. like, okay, I have a, obviously a very unique perspective for those that are watching right now. Um, I'm a mental health therapist, but I've also have experiences with spiritual abuse from being in a cult of Christianity from the ages of 15 through 18. So I really want to stress what loved ones should be looking for right now. And then those who are like monitoring themselves, what they should be looking for to determine if they're being triggered or not. Yeah. And um, Dilesia was a presenter in Nashville at our recent Nashville conference, um, Course Control Cults and Community. And she did an excellent job. So um, thank you again for participating in the series today. I'll go ahead and turn the time over to you to get started and just okay. let me know if you need anything through this. Okay, we will do. So just to give you guys a little bit of information about me, um, like I said before, I'm a therapist. I'm a licensed clinical social worker and I live in Nashville. I have an office that is in the Gulch, but obviously I'm all virtual at this point. Um, as I said before, I also was a member of a cult of Christianity. It, the differences between my experiences in a coercive group and some of the ones that we hear frequently through ICSA is that we were in a mainstream church. So we just went back and forth to church every Sunday, Wednesday, or whenever it was open, but we still had access to our home. So there were a lot of restrictions that happened, but a lot different from someone who's living in a combine or something of that nature. So that's a little bit about me. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and jump into this so that we can get the information as quickly as possible and get to your questions. So I'm gonna be sharing my screen because I have a PowerPoint today. Okay. That's a lot easier than I thought it would be. Okay, let's see. And then Ashlyn, can you guys see the screen or? I, just um, wanna I can't, I, it says that you've screen shared, but I, oh, there we go, there we go. Now I can see it. Okay, gotcha. Okay, so today I am going to be talking about how the coronavirus crisis may be triggering spiritual abuse survivors. And as I said before, my passion for talking about this topic is so that people who are keeping great monitoring of themselves to see what their mental health is at this time can have the tools to look for. And then for those of us who love someone who's been a part of a abusive relationship or ministry or anything of that nature can kind of know what we should be looking for. So first I want to start off with giving an overview of what post-traumatic stress syndrome is. We've all heard it very frequently. A lot of times with my clients they struggle to accept it as a diagnosis that relates to them because they weren't in the military or they never got raped. Those are the two very common occurrences of PTSD that we all associate with. And a lot of times people don't think that they have PTSD or can experience PTSD symptoms unless they have experiences that are related to military life or to sexual abuse. So I wanna first dispel that. I think that to some extent, most of us have likely experienced PTSD symptoms. And when it comes to trauma, trauma is really dependent on the person. So an event can be traumatic to me and not traumatic to you or vice versa. So when it comes to post-traumatic stress syndrome, it's a mental health condition that develops after a stressful, frightening, or distressing event. Sometimes that event could be prolonged, or it can also be an event that occurs just one time. The impacts can be behavioral, psychological, mood, and sleep related. And we're gonna go into a little bit about what you should specifically be looking for in yourself or your loved ones during this time related to those areas. Okay. So what PTSD symptoms might someone who has survived spiritual abuse be experiencing right now? 
behaviorally, they might be isolating. And of course, we know that we're all isolating right now. So when you're looking for isolation in this regard, I would mean, is that person still engaging with the community or loved ones or friends? Are they talking to people via social media? Are they texting back? Are they answering the phone? You know, are they keeping up with their normal day-to-day -day communication outside of being unable to actually leave the house and congregate in public spaces? They may be hypervigilant. So I've seen this amongst a lot of my clients uh, lately where they don't know what's, I mean, really none of us know what's happening next. But for some people, there's a peace and calm that comes from not knowing. And then for others, there you're looking around and trying to figure out what you're missing, uh, what information you need to know. And there's so much information out there now that a hypervigilant person is probably spending the majority of their time on the internet searching for details and facts. And because a lot of information is contradictory right now, they're probably going down rabbit holes because everything is just misleading them. So you might find that, the, that they're very hypervigilant. They also may be extremely irritable just because the unknown sometimes brings a bit of irritation to people because we're not used to living in a space where we can't plan, we can't prepare. There's not much we can do right now. And that feeling of out of controlness often results in someone being irritable or agitated. So if you do talk to a loved one and they, you know, are sort of out of sorts, then that could be why. Or if you are the person that has survived a spiritual abuse relationship, then you might find that you're being irritable and agitated. Psychologically, anxiety. So anxieties are extremely high right now. Again, going back to the out of control aspect, when people aren't in control, we get anxious because we need to be in control to some capacity. So there may be a high level of anxiety with the person that um, is in a spiritual or from a spiritual abuse background. They also may be extremely afraid right now just because of everything that's happening. There may be a mistrust. So perhaps they get information from family or friends or from the news outlets and then they're not trusting that the information is correct or they may be mistrusting their environment so even family and friends I've seen this lately with a lot of my clients as well that maybe they are getting sick and they'll go get tested and they're fine but then they're suspicious of their family members is my family member carrying this and they don't know and you know of course that's another rabbit hole to go down where you think that everyone around you has this disease so there may be a lot of that happening Mood-wise, you'll find that they have a lot of low motivation. So across the board, some of this stuff is happening regardless of whether you're a spiritual abuse survivor or not, which is what makes it very challenging for you to determine if this is related to spiritual abuse or if this is related to just the fact that all of us are in a global pandemic. But low motivation is going to occur. They might have disinterest in activities that once pleased them. So a lot of us are finding that our coping mechanisms are a little bit dwindling right now because some of them involved activities that require us to leave the house. So what you want to look for when you're looking for disinterest is that even those things that they can do inside of the house, they're not doing because they don't, they're not motivated to. There also may be a certain level of emotional detachment, which relates back to that isolation piece. So are they emotionally detaching from people in preparation for the fact that this could go on forever, in preparation for the fact that they're afraid their loved ones may die and don't want to emotionally invest in that. So there's a lot of emotional attachment concerns. And then sleep-wise, there can be insomnia or nightmares as a result of this. So there are a lot of uh, PTSD symptoms. You can Google them. They're in abundance on the internet. But these are the ones that I specifically think we should be looking for right now from spiritual abuse survivors. And that's just based on my own experiences as a survivor and then also on my clinical expertise. So what are the potential triggers? So we know what people who have been in spiritual abuse environments are feeling right now, but why are they experiencing those things? So I came up with a list of seven things that are occurring right this second in regard to COVID-19 that are triggering for spiritual abuse survivors. Scarcity would be one of those. So a little bit about uh, me personally, I grew up poor, so we came from a very impoverished background, but being a member of this church that was very cultic in nature, oftentimes we were encouraged to mismanage our resources because the church needed them. So even though there wasn't a lot of income coming in, we would be uh, obligated to give offerings or tithes and things of that nature for the betterment of the 
spiritual community. And because of that, I think that our impoverished status was worsened. So we already didn't have money and now we have even less money because of the fact that we're being asked to give it. It's our spiritual obligation to give it. You may find that someone who's had an experience like that in their past is very triggered right now because there's so much scarcity. If you go to the grocery store, you can't find tissue paper, you can't find water, you can't find canned goods. All the essentials that the news is telling us that we need are relatively unavailable unless you go to the store in the early morning or late at night when they just stopped. So that could be extremely triggering for someone who was in an environment where they were either sharing their resources with other people or were encouraged to give up all of their resources and uh, information and um, items were trickled down from leadership. This is, is very, very um, indicative of that experience. Then restrictions. So as a former cult member, I know that everything is restricted for the most part. You're not allowed to communicate with people who are outside of the network. Um, you're not allowed to go to the movies, to, I mean, any number of things that would somehow, in the way that they explain it, spiritually taint you, you're not allowed to do. And right now, we're not allowed to do a lot. So of course, being restricted in that way, again, is going to impact a spiritual abuse survivor because it reminds them of the time when they were restricted from so much. And it may be also hard for them to delineate what the restrictions are related to now because of the time that they were restricted in the past. So you may find that there are swarming thoughts about whether or not we're being restricted because we're being separated and God is determining who deserves to live and who deserves to die. So they're probably not gonna have any healthy con cognitions around the reasons for social distancing. Then rituals. So when we think about this COVID-19 crisis, one of the main things we've been encouraged to do is wash our hands, which I would hope most people were doing before then. But that's been a huge push is to wash your hands. Now, when my mind immediately goes to the ritualistic behavior that oftentimes OCD, people who are struggling with OCD go through in the sense of I need to wash my hands four times or I'm going to catch coronavirus or four times I'm going to catch coronavirus and die and go to hell because I'm impure. So as I said, the cognitive structuring around what some of these things are is going to be very, very tainted at this time. And the the fact that we have to wash our hands and we're being encouraged to wash our hands could be taken to mean from a spiritual abuse survivor that we need to create a ritual around how often we're washing our hands. So they might wash their hands every 10 minutes or every five minutes. The thing is to look for patterns in the amount of times that they're doing this instead of it being that they're actually doing it for health, they're do doing it in order to um, help treat a compulsion. Then we have misinformation or complicated and ever-changing instructions. Now, there, like I said before, there's so much information on the internet. There's so much information on the news. There's so much. And not all of it is accurate. And every day it changes. Actually, not even every day. Probably every couple minutes it changes. And at this point, I've just decided to check in a couple times a week and put in Coronavirus Nashville and see how we're doing, because I realized that I couldn't handle the capacity of information that was being thrown my way. And the reason for that is because the misinformation and the complicated, ever-changing instructions are difficult for someone who was born and raised in an environment where instructions were very clear. I knew what to do, I, was, I did what I was supposed to do, and I was rewarded by either being praised or uh, being told that I was going to heaven or something of that nature. This is very challenging for people who have been in that kind of background because the, the instructions aren't clear. They don't know what they're supposed to be doing. Every time they do something, then something else comes out, a new novel idea on how to get rid of this. So you'll notice that they're getting lost and overwhelmed by just how many instructions are being thrown their way. Then mistrust in leadership, which is likely um, not something that a person who's still a part of a spiritually abusive ministry is facing, because usually we really trust our leaders until we don't trust them anymore. So this is probably unprecedented for the average person that's still connected to that kind of uh, institution. But for those of us who aren't, one of the 
things that probably got us disconnected is that we started to distrust what the people above us in the ministry were saying. So the fact that there is now this similar mistrust in state government and federal government and in their capacity to actually handle the crisis and solve it, that again is triggering. Then also the fear of contraction. So when you are in a cult or a spiritual abuse ministry, there's a lot of conversation around um, sinlessness and wanting to be pure and needing to be pure in order to earn your spot in heaven or earn the grace of God. And as a as someone who's been a part of uh, that type of environment, those you may equate health and cleanliness to sinlessness. So possibly looking at those who have contracted the illness as dirty and that they're full of sin and that they're being punished for the things that they're doing. And obviously, as someone who has that type of ideology, you're going to do everything that you can to possibly not be a part of that group, which is where, again, the rituals come into play. Because if I can remain clean and I connect my cleanliness to my spirituality and my standing with God, then the cleanliness is most important. So you're going to find that those people are extremely afraid of contracting the illness and I actually heard a story recently that it, I have no idea if this person is a, is from a cult or anything of that nature, but it definitely relates to this where someone was at a grocery store and they began to go down an aisle and there was a lady that was on the aisle and she immediately started screaming, stay away from me, go around the other way, get away from me. And they went around the other way and she actually was coming down the other side of the aisle at that point. And she again starts screaming and says, didn't I tell you to stay away from me? So that's a bit of an extreme case of what might be happening right now. But there are chances that someone who is from a cult background may be so terrified to catch this because it means that they're sinful in their mind, that they are lashing out on other people in an effort to protect themselves. And that's all it is. It comes from a good place. It's, you know, self-protection, but it doesn't always come out correctly. Then the fear of death, which anyone who has been in a cult knows that the fear of death is something that is always in the back of your mind. You're afraid that you're going to die and God is going to dislike the things that you did while you were on earth. And because of that, you're going to go to hell and hell is not painted out to be this very exciting place. So right now, those who are, who have been in cults, this is amplified for them because of their pre-existing fears of death and hell. So we just need to know that, you know, this time is extremely hard for people who have been a part of uh, these type of environments just because of, of all these things that I've outlined and probably even more things that I haven't outlined. But I also want to go into what potential challenges for the loved ones of spiritual abuse survivors may be. Assessing is going to bring a challenge. The reasons why is because some of us may not be with our loved ones. Maybe the loved one is isolated because they live in a home by themselves and we're now encouraged not to go visit family and friends. So assessing might present a challenge because you're trying to assess from a distance. And if you're assessing someone from a distance, obviously you're not seeing the day-to-day -day interactions that we need to be able to determine that a problem is going on. Also, assessing presents an issue because, like I said, everyone is kind of out of sorts right now. So it's common for people to be anxious. It's common for people to be afraid. It's common for us to feel out of control. But what we want to make sure of is that we don't blame the fact that someone who has been in a cult the fact that they're anxious right now and that they're feeling out of control. We don't want to blame it on the pandemic because it could have multiple layers as to why they're feeling that way. So I think that presents a bit of a challenge too, because you as a loved one don't want to make a big deal out of something when everybody else is doing the exact same thing as your loved one is doing. So noticing that it's happening might be hard. Also, monitoring is difficult. Monitoring is difficult because of the fact that, again, we're not all in the same place sometimes, so the distance is going to present a challenge for that. And then monitoring is a, is a issue for the same reason that assessing is regarding the global pandemic and all of us being out of sorts. It may be hard to monitor someone else's uh, ability to self-regulate when you yourself are trying to self-regulate as well. And then intervening is hard, again, for distance reasons, but also because there's only virtual options at this point. So when it comes to therapy, therapy's happening online, and a lot of people have some qualms about 
therapy online. So I, before this, I had a number of clients who just preferred telehealth because they didn't feel like dealing with traffic and going to the office. But it's, you know, I've had to convince some people that it's better to remain mentally healthy and we meet via video than to just go for months an indefinite amount of time without receiving mental health care. And I actually had some clients to decide that they didn't want to continue. And then a couple of weeks later, they were like, I, I, I have to, I have to do video. So I think that intervening is a challenge because not only do you have to convince someone to be willing to pursue a virtual platform, but you also have to navigate the difficulties that may exist in that virtual platform. So intervening is challenging right now. So self-management and clinical recommendations. When it comes to self-monitoring, um, that is extremely important. So if you've been listening to this and you have realized that some of what I've said is something that you've experienced, then of course it will be your responsibility to be honest with yourself and to acknowledge, hey, I'm struggling. So self-monitoring is extremely, extremely important during this time. That might look like figuring out what your self-talk is. Am I saying negative things to myself about this? Am I being pessimistic? Am I being optimistic? Am I struggling on certain days of the week? Uh, is it that uh, I'll have a couple days good and then after that I'm all negative? It Really just figuring out what your patterns are and what you're saying to yourself, what narratives you're giving to yourself right now. Also, being aware of your feelings during this time. I think this is a time for mindfulness collectively, and that's regardless of whether people have been members of cults previously or not. We all need to be mindful of how we're feeling from moment to moment. So every day when I wake up, I assess, Dalicia, how are you? And it, it's just as simple as that, asking yourself that question, how are you doing today? Because some days you might feel okay, and other days you might realize that you're a little bit triggered, and that's when you need to reach out to someone. And then reality testing. So I love reality testing. It's a CBT uh, technique. And I want to provide an example. So let's say someone has a negative thought and the thought is the world is ending. What they would do is to make a two column sheet of paper. So you have a sheet of paper, you break it down into two columns, either by drawing a line down, down the center or kind of just folding the paper. One side would be whatever the negative thoughts are, and then the other side is gonna be for what the reality is. So obviously the world is ending would go on our negative thought side because there have been no indications that the world is ending. Yes, we all are sick, or we all are facing the possibility of being sick and people are sick, but the world is not ending. So that'll go on the, the side of negative thoughts. And then on the other side would be reality. So reality is that many people and localities have and are recovering from COVID-19. So that contradicts the fact that the world is ending if people are getting better. So if you are finding that you or a loved one is struggling to really tap into what reality is right now, and it's kind of going on a wild goose chase with negative thoughts, this would be a very, very helpful exercise to just sit down and write down every single negative thought and then combat it with what reality is. And then I love affirmations as well. And I think it's just as simple as using those realities as affirmations. So what someone who thinks that the world is ending and uses the affirmation that I chose for reality, many people and localities have and are recovering from COVID-19, that person may take that affirmation and speak it to themselves every day in the morning, after they check in and see how they're feeling. So wake up, Dalicia, how are you? I'm feeling a bit triggered today. Okay, let's go to our affirmations. And that entire reality list could be used for affirmations. Then journaling. I love journaling. Oftentimes people say they don't know what to journal. Start with your feelings. So if you realize that you're feeling triggered, what are you triggered by? So really unpacking emotions, journaling provides an amazing space for that because oftentimes we just identify the feeling and then we keep it moving. We don't actually figure out what the feeling is made up of. So I would encourage you or a loved one to simply journal about how you're feeling each day. Even try and do it two times a day if necessary, maybe once in the morning and once at night. But right now we really need to know actively what's going on in our bodies at any given time. And the, the way to do that is to journal. And then obviously there's telehealth. So as I said before, a lot of therapists, um, I would hope most therapists, are meeting via virtual uh, means at this time. Telehealth is an option. Um, it's not the best option for just getting started with someone. I know that it's kind of weird to be first starting with a therapist and then you're meeting them only virtually. 
it can be awkward. And I know a lot of therapists aren't accepting new clients right now because of that awkwardness. And they really want to actually be in someone's presence before they start using virtual means. But there are therapists out there who are doing it. So I would encourage you to go to psychologytoday.com. Um, there's also openpathcollective.org. And Open Path is for people who are looking for affordable mental health therapy and generally the therapists on open path are charging between 30 and 60 dollars a session and it goes up if they're seeing couples and things of that nature but um telehealth is is certainly an option right now and i would say if you realize that your self-management skills are not necessarily intact at this point then you do want to reach out to someone and you want to overcome the fact that in your mind it's going to be awkward because honestly everybody i've met with who hasn't done virtual before they love it now. And a lot of them are like, I don't even want to return to doing regular therapy once we actually are out of the house again. So that is another um, recommendation as well. And then that is all I have. So I'm ready for any questions or concerns you guys have. Um, and let me stop sharing my screen. And then let me know if I need to go over anything again or anything of that nature. Thank you. And your PowerPoint was so well done and you were so oh, clear you. and concise. Um, and I feel like the information you provided was really practical um, and just really helpful in that regard. Um, I put the link in the comments, um, openpathscollective.org. Um, it's is that open correct? Path. Open Paths. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I just did it again. Perfect. Open Thank path you. Path S. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, you know, we had one question come through and I'm curious. Um, and for those of you who are interested in submitting questions, please do so via the Q&A function and not the chat feature. Um, and I'll answer as many as we can going through. But where does um, irritability um, and anger come into play with feeling triggered with ex-members? Um, what could be the cause of that during this COVID-19 crisis? So one thing that comes to mind is the fact that we don't, as a cult survivor, you don't think that you're ever going to experience anything relative to your cult life in the real world. And this entire crisis has proven that that isn't actually true. You can be isolated in the real world. You can experience some of the things that I mentioned on the um, PowerPoint slide that I did with the seven things that might be triggering. I think this is just a reality shock for everyone because you think once you get out of a group like that, that's the last time you're ever going to have to encounter scarcity or restriction or, you, I mean, you assume that you'll be free from that then on and now we're not. So I think that that can cause a lot of irritation and anger just because what you assume to be something you were escaping from is now a reality for you yet again, even though you did so much work to recover. Yeah. Thank you. Um, another question that came through is, um, with those who are being so cooped up right now, either due to, you know, they're, they may be more vulnerable in terms of health or age or, um, you know, pre-existing conditions, um, what advice can you give, um, to those who are really shut in on the day to day on just how to manage stress? So managing stress uh, when you're shut in, I would say to that we all are social distancing, but that doesn't mean social isolating. So you want to create some structured time to spend time with family and friends. I know that there are even options that a lot of the large companies are coming up with, like Netflix. So Netflix has NetflixParty.com, which allows you to watch a movie with family or friends and have... Oh, cool. Yeah. And NetflixParty.com? netflixparty.com to have chat with loved ones while you're watching a movie so there's some really creative ways to engage with people these days but if that's not something you want to do then obviously facetime works uh facebook messenger just making sure that you're staying active and still talking to people okay. and not you know not completely isolating yourself i would say that that's an amazing way to manage stress and then like i said before i think journaling is helpful because it no longer is in it's out so and better out than in um in getting those thoughts and stress out on paper that they're not inside of your head and taking up mental space. Yeah. It's funny, um, this past weekend, maybe it's not funny, but 
it's funny to me this past weekend um i was feeling stressed for some reason um and it, it's definitely related to what we're talking about something probably just triggered me whatever but i started journaling and it was the first time that i started writing down what i was feeling um and it was a really, sometimes it was hard, but then other times it was really easy. Like it was hard to start, but then once I started, I started feeling better and I felt like the next day it was almost a sense of, oh, like, like that was during the week, like I had it down on paper and it helped me personally. And is there any um, tips on how to get started with journaling um, that you'd recommend? Yeah, so there are journal prompts um, available all over the internet that are often helpful because they'll start off with either a sentence or a question that you can complete. So that's helpful. But I also think, like you said, just tapping into what your feelings are. And there, and I want to send you these resources to possibly send out. But yeah, there's, I'd a love feeling, to. there's a feeling wheel that I use with clients. And the reason being is that oftentimes we think that feelings are just happy, sad, mad, scared you know those are kind of the only ones that we identify when there's so many emotions to describe so many different feelings so sure. if you start with the feeling will and in the morning just figure out what on that feeling will describes how you're feeling then i think that's a great way to get your journaling started because if it's bewildered then we can start journaling I'm bewildered because, and then that's going to bring out so much stuff. Like you said, I love journaling. I journal every day and sometimes it actually lasts for multiple hours. So that shows you that, you know, there's a lot of stuff that we pack on the inside sometimes. And I, I think of journaling kind of like, um, and I, I want to make this example not vulgar, but it's kind of like using the, the restroom in a sense. Like it's clearing yourself of all of the, just waste that you've picked up over time. So I think journaling is super, super helpful. Thank you. You're welcome. Someone said, thank you, Delicia. It's great presentation. This is the first ICSA Zoom I've attended. Oh, cool. Thank you for attending. Yeah. Um, they asked, are the previous presentations available through ICSA or YouTube? The answer is yes. I'm hoping to get all the previous recordings on the ICSA YouTube channel at the end of April. So if you subscribe to the ICSA YouTube channel, you should be notified as new videos come on, um, and they'll be under the Cult Recovery Not Canceled playlist series. Um, so thank you for answering that. Someone um, just said, it is so hard to find a therapist with experience in spiritual abuse. I have tried and tried and experienced everything from rejection of my situation to exploitation again. This has made me feel even more hopeless and alone. How do I find the right one? I tried 28 different ones on psychology today and my emotional health and income is not so that I can keep risking. It's a great question. Yeah, that is a great question. Um, and not something that is atypical of this audience either. Um, I know that a lot of my therapy colleagues do not have any experience on spiritual abuse because it's not something that you hear commonly. And it's not something that even those who have been spiritually abused can often identify as actually happen happening to them. So you may not be able to find someone using that specific keyword, spiritual abuse, but I would say to look for someone who um, has experience with domestic violence relationships because there's a lot of correlation between domestic violence and then this uh, field. I would also be upfront with that person that this is what you've experienced to see kind of what their feedback is. If you realize that somebody's taken aback, that may not be the best person for you because that means that they're looking at whatever you've gone through as something mysterious or something that they can't tackle. But I would like to say that in the midst of spiritual abuse are a number of mental health concerns that every mental health provider should be able to handle. Like obviously there's anxiety in there, there's depression, um, there is OCD sometimes, there might be even some borderline tendencies. So you want to specifically look for some, think about what, um, you want to specifically think about what your spiritual abuse experiences have left you over with. Um, I know for me, I have intense anxiety like around finances as a result of it. So I would probably look for someone who deals with anxiety. So I would ask myself if I were you, what exactly am I struggling with as a result of my experiences and then look for someone related to that. But I, that, I hate that you've gone through 28 mm -hmm. different people and still haven't found the right person. That yeah. makes me sad actually. 
Yeah, that makes me sad as well. Um, thank you um, to whoever asked that question to for being vulnerable with that information. Um, and it looks like somebody else just posted a resource um, to try someone from the Secular Therapy Project through Recovering from Religion. So I haven't heard of that, but that uh, mm -hmm. sounds good. Yeah, and I'll, I'll repeat that just in case they didn't hear. Um, it's called the Secular Therapy Project through Recovering from Religion. Um, thank you for that resource. I haven't heard of it either, but yeah. Um, someone asked, if a former member out of their group for a few years dismisses wearing a mask when outside or not disinfecting her surfaces as recommended, what does that mean? So, of course, we'd have to ask the person what it specifically means, and they might not have the self-awareness to give it, but some thoughts that come to mind are that they could be rebelling. So, obviously, like we said before, what uh, we connected irritability and anger to the fact that someone doesn't believe they would ever face this sort of issue again. That's also probably them lashing out because of that. Like, I thought that my days of being restricted and having to actively watch out for myself and my my uh and protect myself were over and that person may just be kind of opting out of it because they don't have the emotional or mental capacity to go back to living that way again mm. yeah um, but I also think that there's so much information going around right now. Like, I've heard to wear masks. I've also heard that you should only wear masks if you have it. Then I've heard that only elderly should wear masks. So I think the fact that there's so much information being thrown around, um, it's kind of hard to determine if somebody's rebelling or not, because they might be rebelling in one light, but then in another light, they may not be, because somebody else may have said something different. So it, there are so many challenges in determining what's going on right now. Sure. Thank you. Someone said, second that about journaling. Thank you, Dilicia, for suggesting twice a day. The Artist's Way by Julia Cameron writes about how it's like cleaning your windshield. <laughs> I love your analogy. <laughs> I absolutely <laughs> like that too, because it is a lot like cleaning your windshield, because you, you get more clarity from it. Yeah, mm -hmm. I love that. I'm going to have to steal that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, someone asked, and this is an excellent, excellent question, any advice for people raised in Christian fundamentalist cultic groups that taught end time prophecy? The world right now feels different than it ever has, and so it's easy to struggle with apocalyptic thinking because of our current unique situation and preconditioning. Yeah, absolutely. And I can totally relate to that because the uh, group that I was a part of definitely participated in end time prophecy. What I would say is that we have to have some compartmentalization right now. So if someone, this uh, kind of vignette that you gave me, I would imagine that this kind of person is likely looking for ways to validate the fact that the world is ending. They're probably actively looking for research that tells them that, you know, this is happening. So, and this relates to Revelations chapter seven or, you know, something of that nature. Gotta stop. So stopping would be limiting the amount of time that you're spending doing that until you're finally not doing it. And I think looking for ways in which uh, reality is like I said before, the reality testing, looking for ways um, in which what you're thinking is actually not occurring is probably going to be a more healthy way. Because I know uh, when I was a part of the ministry and they would tell us those kinds of things, I'd always be on the lookout for, okay, that just happened. Uh, there was a volcano in Hawaii. That means that the world is ending. And when you're thinking like that, everything is going to qualify as something to be a characteristic that the world is ending. So I first say to just limit your um, amount of time that you're spending thinking like that, and then also to just test reality by outlining what your thoughts are related to the apocalypse, and then finding examples of how that actually is not happening. So I think the example I provided earlier, the world is ending, and then reality is actually many people and localities have and are recovering from COVID-19. That drastically kind of fights against the fact that the world is ending if people are actually still living from this. I can see if like everybody was just gradually dying every day and there was no recovery. So you want to do reality testing for sure. 
someone made the comment on finding a therapist. I printed out ICSA list of therapists. I am so I am also sorry to hear about 28 therapists. Exhausting and hope ICSA can help. Thank you for that comment. Yeah, ICSA does have a counseling resource um, page on its website and um, you know, it's, it's just kind of a collection of people who've participated, who've either spoken at conferences or written articles for ICSA Today or the journal, um, people within the network. Um, and Dilesia is actually on that list as well. So just people we know of who are familiar with cultic issues. Um, so just depending on where you live or, you know, if you're willing to participate virtually with them. So, and you know, uh, in a lot of the mental health practices, uh, obviously we're guided by a code of ethics. And within that code of ethics, they talk about remote populations. So obviously if you live in a remote community, you would get your therapist, whoever your therapist might be, would get a little bit of leeway as to whether or not they actually have to live where you live. Because in a remote community, your resources are lacking. So there could be an argument that facing something as unique as this puts you in a remote community, even if you're in a city. And with that, you might be able to actually look for therapists who are outside of where you live. And if, you know, an issue later comes up with a board or something of that nature, that therapist could then advocate that you search for 28 therapists in your area and none of them were able to help you, which is why you then had to go out of state or something of that nature. So to say all that, ICSA definitely has resources. And I think that that's a strong case that could be argued if somebody's worried about seeing you and not living where you live in. That's a great point, actually, and not one that I had thought of. So thank you yeah. for bringing that up. Yeah. And then right now, a lot of the um, boards have kind of suspended the way that things are going just because everybody's in crisis. So a lot of them are allowing therapists to see people who aren't where they live at. So I would say now is a great time to maximize. If you find someone from the ICS website that you want to work with, start now because then when your relationship continues after COVID is over, they can say that they, they received you during COVID when things were a little bit less regulated. There's also information on, um, and Pat Ryan put the link in the chat function, cultrecovery101.com slash therapists and cult specialists. Um, thank you for that, Pat. Um, someone said, something that is triggering right now is all the conspiracy theories that are floating around right now on Facebook and the internet. It's like a bad virus of misinformation. Yes, it is. <laughs> Absolutely, it is. So something I've personally done, and I don't, so I, the thing about me as a therapist, I don't recommend things to my clients that I don't do or wouldn't do. So something I've been recommending, and I've actually practices, practiced it, is to stay off the internet. Like, I understand that there's not a lot to do right now, and the internet is one of the very few things we can do, but limiting the time that you're spending on social media, and even if you have to, muting people. There are mute options on Facebook. There are mute options on Instagram. So even though you're not actively going after the information that some of your followers are posting, it comes on your timeline. And if you realize that this person is always posting things that triggers you, mute them. And when you mute them, they don't know that you've muted them. So it's a lot different from if you were to actually delete someone because then they would see that you weren't their friend anymore. So I would suggest just having better uh, policing of yourself around how often you are being exposed to that kind of stuff. And even with with the news it, itself, so maybe just watch the news once a day or, you know, limit yourself to a couple times a week or something. So that's not just for social media. That I think that's for any media outlet that we are attached to at this current moment. And it's tough because even on sites like Facebook, where you're not necessarily trying to read the news, Facebook always yeah. has news. Like, I feel like I get most of my news from Facebook just because there's always yeah. Facebook ads and news and so even social media sites can be full of news. It's crazy. Yeah, it um, is crazy. And their news is often the stuff that's wrong <laughs> on the social media sites. Sure, sure. Um, someone asked, are you taking new patients? Yeah, I am. So I think my email is, is my yes. email? Here? Yeah. on the chat function already for you. Okay, perfect. So yeah, I am. And we can just copy and paste the information again. So yeah, I'm Thank taking it. So just if you just email me, then I will get that email and we can move forward with the process. 
Thank you. Um, someone also said, and I wanted to make sure to read this question, um, what is it like leaving a Bible-based group that can seem to be mainstream? Oh, God. It, that I could go so many different ways with that one. <laughs> okay, so I would want to know in what regard, uh, how is it, like, how is it in what regard, but since I probably won't get that, I'll just go with whatever I'm thinking right now. It's not easy, um, especially when you want to create, keep your religion intact. So what I've seen is that a lot of people, in order to distance themselves from that, they become atheists because that's just the easiest way to do it is like, okay, well, none of this is real. I'm just going to completely distance myself. But I was someone who actively knew that people had hurt me, not God. So I really wanted to keep my religion and my just the belief that I had in this ultimate being intact and that was challenging because of having to pretty much delineate between what they done and what God was like who he actually is as an entity so it wasn't easy at all um, especially the fact that this was many years ago at a time when the resources were even more limited so right now there's a struggle to find someone who actually is an expert in these types of subjects then it was even more of a struggle especially because I was a college student and I didn't really even think about therapy therapy existed in our counseling center at school so and those aren't always the best places to go so it was challenging but um, obviously being connected to something like ICSA is a great first step to take because this is an amazing organization one of one of a kind honestly I've never seen any other organization that kind of does the things that ICSA does so I would say stay connected um, and definitely find a therapist for sure because even though I had to self-regulate initially at some point I did need a therapist to work through the things that I couldn't process on my own because we all have blind spots. Even therapists have blind spots. So I would definitely say to find a therapist. Sure. Thank you. Um, someone made the comments. I relate um, to the previous comments. Um, let's see. Sometimes cannot believe I'm still here after all that mind twirling. Remembering badass survivor status helps undo gaslighting and regain, rebuild your own mental wellness. Mad props to survivors. Thank you so much, ICSA and everyone. So thank you for that comment. That was yeah. a very kind comment. Um, and I think, oh yeah, I wanted to... Okay, I think that's, do you guys have any more questions? Um, I think we got through all the chat on our end, but if anyone has any more chat, now's the time to send it through. Um, real quickly, I wanted to highlight just a few things. Um, we're having videos every day this week, um, and some days even twice a day. Um, so this is, we're kind of wrapping up this Cult Recovery Not Canceled series, um, and we're going to end with Jilly Jenkinson and Rachel Bernstein just doing Q&A. Okay. Um, so I don't think there will even be a presentation. The Q&A has been so good um, and it's taken up so much time during the series, which is what we wanted, um, that we're just gonna have a session or two dedicated to Q&A. Um, and I wanted to quickly um, let you guys know that you know, financially, I know things are really hard right now, but we wanna make sure you have all the resources that you can. Um, I would be happy um, to give you guys a free web membership for ICSA. Um, just please email me at mail at icsamail.com if you would like a free web membership um, to get some of those resources. Um, or if you have any questions for me that maybe didn't quite get answered in the session or you maybe didn't want to ask over chat, I can make sure and get those to Dilesia um, as well. Um, we would be happy to answer those. Um, and I wanted to highlight real quickly to our session tomorrow, if I can scroll here. Yeah, tomorrow, um, Wednesday, we have Rod and Linda Marshall Dubrow, uh, Dubrow Marshall, sorry about that, talking about power threat and meaning in the context of a global pandemic. That will be at noon Eastern time. On Thursday, we have at noon, 12 p.m. Eastern, mid-crisis considerations for LGBTQ former members, occultic and fundamentalist groups. Um, and so we just have a lot coming up. Pat Ryan is throwing all these sessions in the chat function um, so that you guys can see what's coming. We have the schedule too um, that we keep updating as well. 
Um, so just reach out if you guys need anything during this time. Um, is there anything that you'd like to end with or say, Dilicia, just to kind of wrap us up? Um, I just want to let you guys know that this is temporary and, you know, we're all suffering. I think that kind of makes it a little easier to go through to know that everybody in the world is in some way being impacted by this. So I just want us to stay strong and to just continue to fight through this. And if you need help during that, that doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with you at all, because all of us need some type of assistance. Yeah. Thank you. And someone commented, these sessions are such a gift. Thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you, guys. I mean, this has been the highlight of my day, my week, honestly, are doing these sessions. Um, and you were amazing, Nylicia. Thank you so thank much you. for presenting again. Um, your info was great. Um, if I get Delicia's permission later on, you know, I, I want to put all these recordings on the ICSC YouTube yeah, channel. Right. Um, and that way you guys can reference them, or if you have a family member or friend who may need to watch this at a later time, um, I'd be happy to get that on. At the end of April is my goal. So thank you guys so much. Thank you for the opportunity. <laughs> oh, you're muted, Pat. I can't hear you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I see your bird went back to where. <laughs> <laughs> the parrot's gone. All right. right. Thank All you, everybody. Right. Well, thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you out there. Bye.